Welcome to the FCC. I hope you've enjoyed your lunch. My name is Tim Huxley. I'm the treasurer of the FCC, and I'm joined up here by Eric Wishart, who's a member of the professional committee. And we're going to be having a little chat with Matthew Marsh, a fellow member of the FCC, uh, a man who enjoyed a glittering career as a racing driver, uh, including winning the Porsche Carrera Cup Asia title, becoming the first Hong Kong driver to race at Le Mans, class wins at Bathurst, even at Macau, uh, and it's a measure of the respect he's held in that so many of his former teammates, uh, sponsors, uh, and, uh, and, and fans, indeed, are all gathered here together. Matthew uh, is now um, a, the uh, Vice President of Asia Pacific for JMI, one of the leading sponsorship uh, brokers uh, who've brought many household names into Formula One, and also he's widely known as the expert analyst on Fox TV's coverage of Formula One. Matthew brings to that uh, really in the thick of it knowledge. And we're just going to show a quick clip of Matthew and uh, his involvement in motor racing and indeed being in the thick of it. Um, so anyway, my point is I think that it doesn't matter really who wins. Does it matter? Sorry, it's a question. Does it matter? Yeah, I guess it does to some degree. Is Nico going to win all of these? No, he's not. Has he been lucky? Yes, he has. You know, the, 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 the debate about the qualifying format, the best part about qualifying this year has been Lewis Hamilton starting for the first two races on the front row, then making a bad start, and then having to fight his way through the field. So, you know, I, I personally don't care who wins. I just like to see cars racing side by side. You said uh, Lewis was on pole the first couple of races. I mean, he, now he can't start. I mean, has he lost his mojo, or is it the new technology that means he's not getting all the help he was getting? Well, you make a very good point because, of course, for those of you who don't know, the regulations were changed this year about how the drivers start. And, and it was because of, there's been various things that were changed for this year. Some of them good, some of them not so good. So we know that, for those of you that watch, the qualifying format they tried for the first two races was a disaster, and they've gone back to the old system. The lack of team radio... Well, again, show of hands, who prefers it when you can hear what the drivers, drivers are saying to the teams? I certainly do. Yeah, good. Well, that's... Could you please tweet about that, write about it? Bernie.Ecclestone at, unfortunately, he doesn't use email. But, um, you know, I think we've lost a layer. So that's bad. And I think that will come back at some point, as it has actually just before the first race, about half an hour before the first race, they changed the regulations slightly to allow some more information. <laughs> the things that have been good are, one is that we've now got three compounds of tyres rather than two, which has introduced more strategy variation. And we've seen that over the... Three races each getting m more complicated, and it's going to get increasingly as the season goes on. And the other thing is that the drivers used to have these two clutch panels, blah, 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 blah. Who cares? The point was they could all do very consistent starts, and therefore whoever started on the pole generally or the front row would be in the corner first. Now they actually have to use skill and dexterity and practice. And I don't think Lewis probably practiced as much as Nico did, probably. And he's made two terrible starts from the position and then he's made an even worse start from the back row of the grid where he crashed on the third corner so I'm not sure what the question was now but anyway it was good I think yes and no my, my own view I think is it, if that you can follow the tire strategy if you want and for those of you that are avid fans you should definitely use the I su suggest you should use the the Formula One app on your tablet or whatever mobile device because it adds another layer to understanding and to following. And as like I said, I was studying the lap times, and you start to see what's happening. But what I, th of course, the reason they did the tyre, the changes to the tyres, wasn't so we could follow tyre strategy. It was so that the racing on track would be better. And that has actually, that's what's happened, isn't it? We've seen, you know, people ask for more overtaking. I don't think overtaking as such is what we want. I think we want the anticipation of drama. And when you went to that Grand Prix in 67, there was an anticipation that somebody probably would get killed. And I don't mean that's why people necessarily went, but there was certainly that expectation, wasn't there, that people could really get badly hurt here today if they're lucky. And, and now it's different. So the anticipation of good racing, we know that the tyres are a bit suspect and they've been made that way. So I agree. Following tyre strategy sort of boring unless you're someone like me with the anorak on and the iPad. iPad under the anorak. <laughs> um, no, I'm not going to say any but more. But being... being you know, you're talking about get the app and get the iPad and everything. Uh, now, that is appealing to, you know, the, the real enthusiast. But we're not doing a great job about attracting the new blood to the sport. I mean, with the free-to-air television is declining. Formula One is often criticized for not having a particularly good social media presence. 
mean, I first watched the race when I accidentally came across the 1970 Italian Grand Prix that the BBC were broadcasting and got hooked then. But so how are you going to actually get the casual viewer that's actually going to make them tug at their dad's jacket and say, let's go to the British Grand Prix or whatever? Well, not by going to pay-per-view television. So I agree with you. I think everybody in the sport is sort of frustrated by that because what's happened is in France, we've lost about half the viewership because it went from free-to-air to pay-per-view. The same has happened. The same is happening probably next year in Germany. In, in the UK, we've gone from the BBC, who would sometimes get 9 million viewers on a Sunday, to now it's split between Sky, which has a fantastic job for the avid fans uh, who pay a subscription fee. And, and there's so much content, you can, it's just almost too much. Uh, and Channel 4 that are now doing the free-to-air. But, you know, they won't, they've never had, I don't think, ever 9 million viewers of any program. Because people have BBC One on in the UK, and it diff seems difficult to go to three more channels to four. You know, so um, it's not that's not a good thing. The, but you, the, the thing about in, the thing about social media, iPads, and so on, that that you know that is engagement. And I do think that whilst we might have a dec you used the word dwindling in a briefing you gave me earlier, dwindling TV, TV figures, and we debated that. I think the the TV figures are declining for Formula One, and that's not a good thing. But I do believe, I haven't got numbers for this as such, but I do believe that the engagement is increasing. And the engagement's increasing, particularly through social media. I, my colleague with the shoes told me that the 55 million uniques on formula1.com, that's 55 million of us, you know, that, well, some of us. That's a good thing. Matthew, can I read you some quotes? Bernie Ecclestone, who built Formula One into what it is today. In the past few months, Pushing through the turbo engines was a massive mistake. These engines are slowly destroying Formula One. Qualifying was crap. I wouldn't spend my money to take my family to watch a race. No way. Then he said, imagine if people turned up to watch the Rolling Stones and Mick Jagger couldn't sing and the others couldn't play their instruments. That was him talking about Formula One. Yeah. Why is the man who basically was the ringmaster that turned Formula One into this global phenomenon doing this? What's, what's, why is he doing it? Because it's not helping your viewing figures, is it? No. One of my personal viewing figures are at an all-time low. <laughs> <laughs> um, and speaking of which, those of you that use Twitter, could you please follow me on Twitter? Because it would essentially double my Twitter numbers. There must be about 50 people in the room. <laughs> I follow you. Alex Young has 40,000 Twitter followers or something. I have 400 and, I don't know, it was 463. It's probably less than that now. Um, that's a dwindling figure. Um, why does Bernie say it's a mystery? I have no idea. Um, really, other than he's always three or four or five steps down the road doing something for another reason. Is he right? No. I think maybe that day the qualifying was crap. I can't remember the other ones, but no. You know, no. Is there, is there an ulterior motive in his part? Yeah, probably. And, and that's, I think, it, you know, part of the discussion here is, are we talking about Formula One, the sport that we enjoy watching? Are we talking, or are we talking about Formula One, the business that very few of us in the room are involved in, or are we talking about the intersection between the two and how the business part can sometimes affect the sport part? And I think that's probably, it's the left two parts. The, I find the business part, I work in the business of motorsport, the commercial side, I find it somewhat tedious when I'm at the racetrack because there's so much really good stuff going on. Charismatic drivers, exciting racing, unbelievable technology. The cars now are going faster than I want to say ever before, certainly faster than the, the V10 engine cars that we had several years ago, on 30% less fuel. That's significant. And those, by the way, those V10 engines were about the most efficient uh, petrol engines ever made then. Okay, the, the efficiency was for, for, for power, but you can, you can change the parameters around. It's about how efficient you burn your molecules, right? Your carbon molecules. And now we're doing, there's a, there's a, there's a small device about that size that generates, it's, it's the hybrid system, it generates 160 horsepower, which is your family size, or small compact saloon, for 95% of the lap, reliably. All 22 cars finish on Sunday. So if you want to get into the tech, it's fascinating. And a lot of the brands that come into Formula One, and that's, by the way, healthy as, as healthy as ever, and healthier in many respects. We've got some really big global brands now, rather than just the endemic Exxon Mobiles and Shells and, and the tyre companies and so on. Um, those brands come in because they can relate to this technology. And we have clients at GMI that are, that are involved in Formula One, but you never see their branding on the car. And what they're actually doing is part partnering with the advanced engineering division of a Formula One team. I was talking to somebody the other day from Unilever who told me that 
which is a client, that their ice cream, Magnum ice cream, I would never try one, obviously. Um, the, the, the fridges they, they give to the shops to sell the ice cream in. They had a problem, which was that the temperature... But you love this, isn't it? This is a Formula One conversation about ice cream. But I love it, because this actually is why F1 is relevant commercially. 15 degrees different between the top of the fridge and the bottom. It's one of those fridges with the glass on the top, and you open it up, and you take your ice cream out, and the kids leave it open. And, and that was affecting the product. And they mentioned this to the guys at Williams. They're a partner of the Williams team. You see the Rexona deodorant on the side of the car. Um, and the Williams guys use their aerodynamic skills, they use what's called computational fluid dynamics, to come up with a new interior of the fridge that stops the cold air escaping. It's reduced electrical consumption of the fridge, and the product's now better. Wow, ice cream is improved by Formula One. So does this make it an easier sell when you're trying to sell to a multinational company that's got numerous platforms available to it to promote its goods? Is Formula One an easy sell? Well, my boss is in the room, so I have to say that I'm working harder than ever, and it requires real, you know. <laughs> um, I don't think it's, no, because we, you know, Formula One is not the only, motorsport is not the only platform that's being intelligent these days. It's not about stickers on racing cars in the same way that football and others, and rugby and so on. But certainly it, there's a broader range of what we're talking to brands about, and, that, and I gave one example. Let's throw this um, conversation open to the floor. So if any of you do have a, a question you'd like to throw in, uh, please raise your arm and we'll get a, a microphone. If you just sort of introduce yourself briefly. Matthew and I go back a long way. Um, we both used to race, but in different eras. So I think Matthew was probably more successful than I was. However, 21 races this year. Is that too many, Matthew? OK, two different answers. Me as a fan, no. Great, every two weeks, sometimes every week. Love it, fantastic. Um, you as, as viewers on Fox, probably, <laughs> actually. But I was talking to some people in the paddock in Shanghai, and I think the opinion is, yes, we really are, it's too much. Um, you know, Martin Brundle, who you see on the TV, who, who, who knows more about the sport than most people have forgotten, said, the trouble is, by the end of the year, because you know, we're going to these great locations, amazing races and great hotels, but it's still every other week, and it's tiring, and it starts to emanate from us, and the broadcasters know it. They start to become a little bit sour in what they're talking about. So that's one element. I think the mechanics, the team, you know, those guys, you can imagine they're doing 21 weekends a year. That's two days of holiday times 21 they've earned, right? We'll just do the maths on that one. Plus, they've probably got whatever it is, three or four weeks of holiday. Well, they, they can't take that holiday, so, and they, they, they can't. So, you know, that disrupts family life. Um, Kenny Handkammer, who used to be the chief mechanic at Red Bull a few years ago in Abu Dhabi, final race of the season. I think it was when um, Vettel won his first championship. I said, are you all right? He, looked quite, he said, well, I've got pneumonia at the moment, but it'd be okay. And, that, and he had pneumonia because he just too much, and, and I think we'll get a bit of that this year as well. What's going to happen next year? Who takes over from Bernie? Who's going to run Formula One? Where's going to be the new energy to take the sport to the next level, or will it just continue with someone else? I, I suspect he has, is transferring his brain into the body of a younger lady, probably. Um, no, no insight. There doesn't seem to be a succession plan. But I, and I'm going to take you to task slightly, Colin, if, excuse me, because I don't think Formula One is dominated by Bernie. There's, the business element of it is dominated by Bernie. But what we watch between the lights going out on a Sunday afternoon and the checkered flag going out, coming, whatever it is, coming on, that's not dominated by Bernie. That's dominated by 22 of the best racing drivers on the planet driving the most exciting racing cars on some of the best racetracks. Uh, we've got Azerbaijan coming up, and uh, we've lost Korea and India along the way, and then also Monza and Silverstone and Spa and all these places that really are traditional that, to me, would actually tear the soul out of the sport. Um, do you think it's important that those legacy venues are retained? I think it's important for us the avid fans. I don't think it's necessarily important for the business because, to put it into context, an, you know, a, a new country like Azerbaijan coming on will sign a contract for, I don't know, 40 million euros a year, five-year deal, okay? It's actually not that much money, if you know what I mean. There are people in Hong Kong, right, who could have said, no, I could do 40 million euros a year. Not very many, probably not in this room, but there are people that could do that. So for Azerbaijan to do that, to get their name mentioned at the FCC, is actually a pretty good deal. And that money, of course, ends up, 
sort of filtering through some friction points, but some of it gets to the teams and pays for the guys to be on the grid. So that's, you know, whereas Imola, much better place to go for pasta and enjoying your racing and driving a racing car probably, but they couldn't afford to pay more than five, I guess. So Bernie's choice is, is, is simple. Um, for us, the fans, I think it does, yeah. I think we need, we need these places that make F1 mystical. You know, we, we've lost Imola. That's a real shame, isn't it? But luckily, we've got Monza. I don't think we'll lose Monza, but, you know, Bernie's always negotiating and saying, I've got Azerbaijan, I've got, you know, Turkmenistan next or whatever it is. So and, just, and just, sorry, one more thing. Because um, I checked this on the way here today, thinking that Tim would raise this. There were the, the spectator numbers for Shanghai at the weekend, the total audience over three days was 140,000. And I'm giving you the official number, but all the official numbers at every race are slightly probably optimistic. But if you, as long as you track the official number every year, you get a sort of a sense. And, it's, and they're back up to the highest number ever since the first race in 04. And as those when 260,000 people turned up. Yeah, official number. Official number. So, yeah, but, but, but my point is, yeah, the first year of any event in Shanghai is going to get a quarter of a million people over three days. And we're back to 140,000. And there was a really good atmosphere there. And let's not forget also that Saturday, it rained like crazy. So we lost a lot of people for sure on Saturday. So there were a lot of people there. There's a train line that gets you there. And, and the, the cumulative audience, sorry, this is a bit staty, but the cumulative audience on TV last uh, for 2015 was 6% up. This is China only. 6% up on the previous year. And I've always seen that the fans in China that you see at the racetrack, they're, 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 really, they're really into it. They know the drivers. They know... So I was at the, uh, Hilt, uh, the Hilton Hotel. And the McLaren team stay there. There's a, there's a crowd of young people behind a tensor barrier outside the front of the hotel. They're fans, and they're wearing McLaren jackets and so on. This is actually a couple of years ago when McLaren was a team that people used to follow. Um, <laughs> and, and somebody called my name who I'd met before, and I said, what are you doing here? She said, well, we're waiting for the McLaren team. And it was after dinner. I said, no, but, you know, Jensen and Lewis at the time. I said, they'll be back in there. Oh, no, no, we've seen Jensen and Lewis. We're waiting for Steve Cooper. And I said, wow, Steve Cooper? And she said, yeah, yeah, he's the media guy. And I said, yeah, I know who Steve Cooper is. How do you know who Steve Cooper is? Oh, well, we saw him on the TV in the background. He, was, he did a fist pump at a race, and we all talk online. And we, somebody knew it was Steve, and now we all know it's Steve Cooper. We're Steve's fan. We talk to him every night. So my point is that they're really avid fans who know more about Formula One than probably a lot of us in the room do, and they communicate in this online environment that for most of us is, is something we've never seen. Matthew, you mentioned Hong Kong. We've got, I think we've got a Formula E race coming up later this year. So I would just like to hear your thoughts on that as a, as a category of racing. And do you see any prospects for Formula One coming here? I mean, Singapore gave, was, had a big jump in Hong Kong when it came to... Formula One, um, so, so a double barrel question. Um, I think it's great that Formula E is coming. Um, who's seen a Formula E race, Hans? Anybody? Oh, okay, yeah. So it's not Formula One, and they're not trying to be Formula One. So they're bringing the races to city centres rather than having them, you know, even Singapore is kind of on the side of the city, if you know what I mean. Uh, I think it's a great thing that's coming to our city for many reasons outside of that particular event. We obviously, we know that. We don't really have a government, do we? We have sort of a caretaker. Um, we need a government that is going to be thinking about these sorts of big events that bring attention to our city and, show, and hopefully show that our city can put on these big events. Um, it will attract people to come who might then think, oh, this motor racing is kind of interesting. I'd like to see some more. I might go to the Macau Grand Prix in November. I might go to the Grand Prix in Shanghai. So I think it's, I think it's a good thing. And Formula One in Hong Kong, is that a possibility? Can you imagine LegCo? <laughs> 40 million what? Where is this property we're building? <laughs> Who's making money out of it? Um, you talked about money and how it filters down through the system. And you know, the division of revenues in Formula One is sort of uh, fairly opaque, uh, but some of it was revealed. And it worked out that, somebody worked out that if Ferrari parked up at the first corner, and they nearly did that in Shanghai, um, they would still actually take more money home than the team that comes fourth in the championship. I mean, you accept that Ferrari is a sort of legacy brand and it's really important to the sport, but is that distribution of revenues, um, is that fair isn't a word you'd normally associate with anything to do with sport, but that's really going to stop any 
new team. It's 25 years since Jordan came in on the sniff of an oily rag. It's very difficult to break in when that revenue distribution model is as it is. So I think a couple of answers there. One is he created it, Bernie. You know, Formula One was a ragtag bunch of guys going racing. I don't mean that pejoratively, but you know, it's Ferrari did their own thing. So, and the race organizers would say, Mr. Ferrari, do you want to come to the race? Yep, yeah, brilliant. How many cars? Three, three, okay. Lotus, da, da, da. And then they'd ring other people. And as they went down the list, the starting money would get smaller. And obviously, what Bernie said is that they can't have a race without us. You know, they need 15 of us to go with the three or four or five of them, right? So let's all get together as a collective. I'll, I'll manage you, give me a mandate. And they gave him a mandate. They're very good at running racing teams and not particularly good, maybe at that time, of understanding what Bernie was going to do with the mandate, which was take complete control of the sport, understand that TV was the future, control the revenue, and then sort of give some of it to them. And from Bernie's point of view, he'll think, that's my money. I generate that money. Uh, the numbers on it, just I, I checked this this morning as well, 1.3 billion is generated by Bernie's organization, which is a small organization, in hosting those, those fees for the races and the broadcasting rights. And then he generates another quarter of a billion dollars in sponsorship from brands like Rolex and Emirates and, um, and others that are coming into the sport. By the way, it's very healthy for next year. And he'll be thinking, why have I got to give it to those guys? And I kind of understand what he's saying because why should anybody get a leg up coming into Formula One? It's a meritocracy. You know, they line the cars up in order on the grid from the fastest to the slowest. It's a bit of a hint. You know, they line the cars up in the garages from Constructors' Champion at one end to the guys who didn't win the Constructors' Championship at the other end, and the garages, by the way, get smaller. So it's very difficult to get up. The, the, you better be determined to do it. And Bernie's not going to give you a, a leg up, and I don't think you should. You know, it's like Sauber. Oh, poor Sauber's going out of business. They have produced terrible racing cars for the past three years. They've done an awful job of raising sponsorship. Bye. Just don't deserve to be there. Well, it's, it's, no one says this team in the Premier League shouldn't be relegated. On oh, the subject of which, have we got a Leicester City sort of story coming up in, in Formula One that really gets everybody stirred up? I mean, the new Haas team doesn't sort of stir the passions like Leicester City going from relegation to Premier League contenders. I, I, so, who likes the Haas team? Yeah, I like it too. Here's a team that, that uh, Gene Haas is an intelligent guy, he's looked at it and said, I'm not doing it that way. That doesn't work the way that Sauber and others have done it. I'm going to talk to, probably talk to Bernie at the beginning and listen to what Bernie said. And I suspect Bernie said, do a deal with Ferrari. Montezemolo, that, that, that kind of conversation. And that would come, and he would have done probably as he was told by Bernie. Because Bernie loves it when a guy like this comes in. And then he can say to Peter Sauber, unt, you know. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, he's saved the career of Romain Grosjean. Third thing is, TV figures are up in the US. And it's, a, it's, a, it's now the seventh largest market, not because of Gene Haas, but it's, this is, he's part of a resurgence of interest in the USA. So it's a good thing. We've got I a question over here. Sorry. No, here. no, just a reaction to the Ferrari point in that um, they also built for themselves a very, very good business model of crea creating the road cars to fund um, their team. And it's become a self-perpetuating machine and a cycle. And, you know, if anything for that, they should be rewarded. I agree. Same thing. Formula One wouldn't be Formula One without Ferrari, would it? So, and, and the only reason they could negotiate that position on the revenue split, and for those of you who don't know, Ferrari get a sort of a bonus for being Ferrari, uh, you know. It seems to me that, you know, um, there are a lot of fixes in place today. DRS, so cars can actually pass while they're uh, unable to pass because of the aerodynamics of the cars. Uh, you know, the tire thing to make the racing more exciting, right? Some of this is due to sort of the over-sophistication of the cars. I mean, you know, I, I do believe that uh, power units, hybrid power units, like in Formula One cars, or even more relevantly in World Endurance Championship cars, those are really good things. And that's the technology that really is going to be relevant for all kinds of industries, not just, not just the auto industry. But spending millions and millions of dollars changing the veins on the front wing, you know, for a specific racetrack. I mean, this keeps smaller teams from becoming competitive. And it seems like, on the one hand, I wouldn't say you want to put a cap on, on spending on technology for Formula One, but maybe there should be a balance of performance, you know, where 
the, the top teams get less of a return when they spend their $10 million. Yeah, but, uh, but if they did have that, Unilever's ice creams wouldn't have been as well looked after. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But no, I, I know what you're saying. I think, Tim, you calculated that there was a million dollars worth of front wings destroyed at the first yeah. lap of the Shanghai race, which is a bit silly, isn't it? I mean, it has gone. I, I think the DRS thing, which is where the flap opens on the car that's following another car, I think is a good thing. And by the way, that's only a reaction to the fact that the aerodynamics are so sophisticated now that it's very difficult to follow the car ahead of you through a corner. So it's just, it's just, it's not, it's not tweaking. It's tweaking back to get back to what we all think we loved, which was the cars that Eric saw in '67 that didn't have aero or didn't have very effective aero on them, and, and, and the tyres were simple, and, and, and the distance between the first guy and, and the second at the end of the race should have been a minute and a half. By the way, that's the other point, you know. Alfonso Emanuele, um, I guess putting together this conversation, the question is that we got very scared in 2008 and 2009 when the number of teams went dramatically down. We were wondering, are we going to race with 12, 15 cars? So wh where is, in your opinion, the the way out is in the custom cars, the kind of like the Haas, is in giving more money to the small teams, is a mix of these. How do we avoid it to become just too few cars on the track? Well, the, the first thing is we've got 22 now. So that's, I think, moderately healthy. Um, we might be down to 20 if, if, if Sauber does go out of business. And by the way, not a great idea to let the business know that you might be going out of business when you're looking for sponsorship, just as a hint to future teams. <laughs> yeah. Our businesses in general. It's a shame they're not based in Hong Kong rather than Switzerland, right? Um, I, so I, a, I don't think, I think that all of these things that we've been debated in the media recently about the qualifying changes and distribution of revenue and blah, 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 all of these things are to make sure that the sport stays uh, relevant and sustainable commercially. So I, I have, I, you know, whilst it looks a bit messy because we're seeing it, the laundry is being washed in public, I think it's a sign that the governance in inverted commas isn't asleep at the wheel. Uh, Matthew? William Perklow, over the back. Thanks. Is, <coughs> Matthew, is there any um, evidence on the horizon to suggest McLaren may make a comeback anytime soon? And what, what's gone wrong there? Well, there is evidence, isn't there, Will? Because they've, you know, last year the cars are most often seen stationary with smoke pouring out the back of them. Uh, and I don't mock because, you know, it's a, you know, <laughs> I like to call it a laugh, but thank you for that. <laughs> you can come again. But, you know, it, it's difficult, isn't it, Formula One? And the Honda came in, and Honda probably thought they had a better idea, and they, and they and, and as I understand it, they weren't listening particularly well to what they're being told. But this year, their reliability has been really strong. The pace is, well, they qualified just outside the top 10, I think two of the last three races, something like that. Um, they didn't get into the top 10 in Shanghai. They thought they should be finishing in the top 10 this weekend. They didn't, but mostly because nobody else retired or fell off or did anything dramatically wrong. So I, th I think we'll, yeah, I think they're going to be point scorers sort of relatively consistently this year. And if they can get rid of their old drivers and get the new guys in, I say it slightly flippantly, but actually quite seriously as well, if they can get rid of the other guys and get the young guns in, they'll be doing, they'll have a lot more money to spend, for example, and they could do quite well. Question just on the table, there's two. Uh, Diane Espley. I was wondering if you can say something about the role of the um, FIA and how they're involved in the regulations at the moment and whether that's affected Bernie's attitude recently. <clears throat> so when I go to a Grand Prix, I get issued a pass by either the FIA or by Bernie. So thanks, Diana, for your <laughs> helpful question. <laughs> and I should point out that, by the way, I've never had an issue. That's because nobody watches us on Fox um, or r reads my tweets. Um, hmm. Well, okay, here's what I think we, we can say about the FIA, the bit that I understand of the FIA very well. Because there's bits of it I kind of haven't, you know, you see the Jean Todd Bernie Ecclestone interface, so, so, so to speak. Mm, that's never going to go well, is it? But the bit that I think the FIA does very well and they work very hard on and very sincerely on is safety. And we've seen, you know, we saw the dreadful accident. 18 months ago to Jules Bianchi. He unfortunately perished eventually from that. But that has not, you know, that wasn't just a way, it was a waste of life, obviously. But they have learned lots of lessons for that. And they're constantly innovating as, as in the same way that Williams is innovating Unilever's ice cream fridge. The FIA guys are constantly thinking about runoff area distances, 
the type of barriers we should use, the head protection system we talked about before lunch. You know, it's just it's uh, wheel tethers. You know, these days the only time you ever see a wheel, touch wood, generally speaking, flying in the air is when it's come off because the wheel nut wasn't on properly. But these days wheels don't fly around like they used to. It's so much safer in Formula One than it used to be. What do you think of the head protection? Because that's going to change the look of Formula One. The semi-closed cockpit. Yeah, I'm, I don't know the answer in my head at all, because as, as a driver, and uh, Daryl, you might have an opinion, but you know, you, I liked having my head out the cockpit, and I was a really bad driver, as you saw earlier, so you'd think, really? <laughs> That's not sensible. I was younger and even more stupid then, but um, you know, I, I, I think as a driver, Lewis has said he doesn't want to have it. The drivers probably don't want to have it. You know, without being silly or sentimental, you know, but when a guy gets killed, a lot of people, uh, the impact is on lots of people. So, you know, and I don't think it's up, I don't think it can be up to the drivers. The, the decision has to be made by a, a, an authority like the FIA, basically. You say, we know you don't want this, but for your own good, you know. It's the same as the drink driving rules and the, and the gun regulations that some countries have. Any further questions? Yes, Jeff. I can't give Jeff two. There's a okay. question over here. Because he's going to start getting Let's into go a wedding. Over there first. Let's go over there first. Sorry. Jeff and I were at the bar Hiding together. Behind, and hiding behind Matthew's head. And there was Mika Hakkinen in the corner. And <laughs> was he there? Was it Mika? No, I'm not sure. Don't <laughs> microphone. He can't answer. Actually, Jeff, let me ask you a question. No, no. <laughs> Matthew, Michael, Michael Corcoran here. Um, you made reference to the F1 app being a, a good tool, which I completely, completely agree with. And there's tons of information and whatnot. But I can watch a rugby match, a basketball match, football match online. How come I can't do that with F1? Has Bernie missed the, the digital boat? No. Well, no, I don't think so. I think the basic problem, there's 1.3 billion problems, or what, that, that, you know, that, that revenue he generates from hosting and from the, from the TV, um, the rights, is a lot of money. And if he felt that he could do that from you paying your subscription on an iPad or other tablets are available, um, then he would. And, and that's why he's going in the pay-per-view direction on TV, because he thinks he can generate more revenue today than... And obviously, it will have a detrimental effect in the future, because the free-to-air is creating the young fans of the future, and, and they won't necessarily see it if it's a subscription. But to get back to your point, I think Bernie's all, Bernie definitely in the past struggled with how do I make money from the internet, and he still hasn't... Got his, and, and by the way, if you've got a good idea, feel free to share it, because I, I, how would he generate revenue from that? You know, would people actually pay? It's a bit like pay-per-view. Would they really pay t to watch online? If they, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a good debate, and it's one that, and I'm sure he's thinking about it. And I also know, I had a conversation the weekend, that Bernie has started to put, to put around him, and he's got a lot of really you know, bright commercial people around him, obviously, that he knows in the sport. There's lots of people. But he's actually also started to ask different unusual people, people that are from s certain countries and different, and different industries. He wants to have access to those people. He's certainly, as a, again, like the FIA with innovation and safety, Bernie's not asleep at the wheel. He's, he wants to keep growing the business. He wants to make more money, and, and he wants to keep the sport alive and growing. Just one last question here, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Michael Nagler. Um, is, is there too much control from the pit lane? You have the engineer, you know, coming with various strategies, and you actually, I found in the last race, some of the drivers were confused. They're saying, hang on, which strategy are we on? Uh, and it just seems like the race has been controlled now, you know, uh, increasingly from the pit lane. It's a good, it's a good question, um, Michael. I think, and by the way, Michael's son, Carl, thinks that I'm Mika Hakkinen, which is a fantastic thing. At least there's one person who thinks I'm Mika Hakkinen. Um, I think that this, it, this actually goes back to the radio, the team radio ban for this year. That's the reason the drivers are confused, because in the past, they would be told, you're going on to plan B, and they knew what plan B was. Um, and we're going to be running three laps longer, or, oh my god, my tires are going off, what should I do? And they'd be told, you know, in the past, they'd be told, adjust your differential so that they wouldn't wear the rear left tire as much, or whatever it was. Um, so I think, number one, is it being controlled from the pit? Well, less so now. Is that a better thing? I don't think so, because what we've lost is that insight into all sorts of things. We've lost the insight into technically what is going on, because we used to hear on the radio the teams telling the drivers, the drivers telling the teams, my tyres are wearing out. Oh, okay, that was, a, that was information we don't, we don't know now. We can sort of try and work it out from looking at the, the timing. 
um, we could hear the, the psychology of the driver. You know, you, those of you that watch the sport, the difference in Lewis Hamilton's tone of voice on the radio when he's happy and when he's sad is extraordinary, and you can start to see it. Rosberg sometimes saying, don't talk to me again. Well, that's because he's concentrating, right? He's, you know, so we know the guy is paying attention. So um, I, I personally, I don't have a problem with, the con with, with advice from, from, from the garage at all. I mean, when they used to be able to in the, in the 90s, it was banned. They could control from the garage what was happening in the car. That was a bit too much. But being able to t tell the driver to do something is a different, different story. Right, well, that takes us up to our allotted time. So, Matthew, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great pleasure having you. Uh, we always uh, try and make sure people don't leave the FCC empty-handed. Uh, and uh, unlike so many of our guests, you do actually wear a tie. So I'd like to actually present you with an FCC tie. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks very much, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>